everybody. This is the Coffee with the Geek program. It is July of 2024. Summer is in full swing. We're getting ready for uh, holidays here in the United States. With me today is a special guest, and I'm going to ask you to pronounce your name so I don't uh, mess it up. <laughs> yep. uh, Preeton. Okay. Yep. Preeton Shah. Okay, thank you, Preeton, for joining me. Uh, really excited to talk with you. I know you've done a lot of work uh, with artificial intelligence in the education. And that's really what we want to, I think, spend uh, most of our time chit-chatting about because I'm really interested. You have a new uh, book out. And uh, I'm going to let you kind of introduce all of that, including yourself. And I'm going to just really kind of be a learner today and uh, tap into all your expertise and talk to you about AI and education. But first, if you would, um, could you please uh, just Let's start with uh, where it's Coffee with the Geek. So any coffee choice that you like? Any coffee um, blends? I am a cold coffee person, and that's probably my New England education showing up, no matter of the season. <laughs> um, it will be a cold brew um, and a nitro cold brew if I can find one with that creamy, foamy top on. Wow, OK. That sounds good. And I did see in your background you've been to Harvard, so that's where your New England <laughs> experience where comes in. Uh, yes, the Duncan um, extravaganza um, is very, very strong in Massachusetts, and so um, that got me through college. All right. So just a little bit from the reading that I did, it seems like you've been kind of a world traveler and worked on a lot of different things in education, which I want you to dig into for me, um, and then we'll kind of work through our book. But if you could... Uh, can you talk to me about what I like to call this question, your educational journey? Like, where did it start? Where did it, where did your love for education come into play? Can you kind of walk through your background? Yeah, of course. Um, and this is a fun question for me because I think my own education and my journey through um, like work in education has kind of been intertwined um, from an early age. Um, I started my first nonprofit in high school um, and that we were an ed tech um, nonprofit doing online peer tutoring. That was peer to peer. Um, across the world. Um, and that one um, kind of allowed me to start seeing what it meant to try innovative solutions to um, problems that online tutoring wasn't as popular as it is now when I was in high school. Um, and so it was still something innovative and we were able to kind of um, do tutoring with students from um, 25 different countries. And so um, that was a cool project um, that really got me started in trying to explore what different um, avenues there are to solving some problems in education. Um, I took a gap year between high school and college um, and I spent that year uh, teaching ESL in South Korea, um, teaching debate in South Korea, um, but also working more on the nonprofit, starting some chapters in a couple of different states, um, and using that to kind of get more students involved in um, basically change making uh, at using the nonprofit peer tutoring model. Um, and so that was a great year because I kind of got to do some classroom experience, but also keep working on ventures of my own. Um, then um, I started my undergrad years. Um, and I, I had a focus on philosophy um, that included education philosophy, um, questions about what makes uh, our educational systems, uh, what would make our educational systems more just, what the purpose of schooling is. A um, couple of computer science classes. Um, a lot of my computer science is self-taught, but I did get a chance to take a couple of classes there and kind of explore um, some theoretical backgrounds in computer science. Um, but also lots of poetry and rhetoric. Um, and some of that will come up if when we talk about some of the bigger questions that AI kind of opens up. Um, and at the same time, I was building my civics nonprofit. And so um, we were trying to bring the liberal arts education model to the K to 12 level. Um, the quick, like our quick uh, pitch for um, why that's important is because uh, we like the foundations of liberal arts education kind of talk about how important it is for a vibrant democracy. Um, and the price tag on liberal arts education is really high right now. And so the easiest way, in our opinion, is to kind of integrate some of those uh, materials at the K to 12 level where we have fully funded public education in most parts of the country. Um, that journey kind of got me more involved with figuring out te uh, technology solutions. Um, and so as a funding model for the nonprofit, I actually started doing some consulting work um, with other nonprofits, with schools, universities, um, and building solutions for them, whether it be custom LMSs, um, standards-based learning and mastery learning platforms. Um, during the pandemic, I got the opportunity to work with uh, all sorts of institutions on helping preserve online learning, online activities. Um, we hosted some of the largest uh, competitions and during the pandemic um, for students. And so we hosted debate tournaments and model UN conferences um, and kind of provided digital tools to make all of that possible. Um, while folks were all at home. Um, 
that brings me to present day. Uh, all of that kind of uh, built up the relationships, um, kind of got me the opportunity to start thinking about what the biggest problems were that folks were looking for technology to solve. Um, and when the when ChatGPT's um, GPT-3 at that point became public um, and it caused um, an uproar, um, I was sitting there very excited. I was like, oh, I can like add this feature to my platform and this feature to my platform and we can do this for this client. Um, and oh my gosh, so many things that were dreams um, for uh, all of us trying to figure out how to uh, you know do cool things in education became possible. Um, and I got clients coming out back to me and saying, wait, this is the worst thing that's ever happened. Uh, we need to like, we. what are your solutions for this? Do you have AI detection systems? Um, how do we deal with plagiarism? And that was kind of the focus. And so um, I had to pivot from being this happy, um, excited person to kind of doing some more of a quelling uh, of fears and helping folks navigate it. So that brings me to present day, but I'll, um, yeah. So definitely a windy path um, through education. I, I love that question. First of all, it kind of helps the guests introduce themselves and walk through their background. Uh, the fascinating piece that I found from that, as you said, you took a gap year, uh, just from describing, you know, what you, your journey, there was, you were, seemed really passionate about it and really energetic in, in that. So it seems like you're passionate about education in general. Um, and it also seems like you've done a lot in really a short period of time. It seems like you really like to take on new challenges. The gap year seems like anti, <laughs> uh, anticlimactic compared to what you were, you know, the rest of your journey. Was the gap year really just to give yourself a focus? Uh, you know, I know there's a lot of students here that, you know, again, sometimes you think the gap year can kind of be a an obstacle and maybe kind of put you into a, you know, a, a downturn. But can you tell me about that? And maybe did you go into the gap year with a focus to just learn and know that this was truly, you had other th plans? Can you dig a little deeper in that? That fascinated me. Yeah, for sure. Um, and here's here's an extra piece of information. There were three gap years in total, actually. So I only told you about the first one for the sake of um, brevity, but I took one uh, before freshman year of college, one after freshman year of college, um, and then two between um, my college and master's. Um, and so uh, lots of, I, I can rave about why gap years are important, um, especially uh, that first gap year was extremely important in terms of helping me kind of, um, you know, get a break from high school. High school is a very different time um, there's a lot of like identity um, formation that happens in those crucial years, um, but high school isn't the most conducive, especially when you're like gearing towards a competitive admissions process. Um, and so having that year to kind of figure out what my intellectual interests were, um, figure out where what my strengths were, um, and what excited me was definitely um, very useful. I did go into the year with the intention to mainly work on the nonprofit. Um, I wasn't, there wasn't a real good transition plan in my head um, for what would happen if I started school right away. I was nervous about freshman fall and running a company. Um, and so the gap year was supposed to give me some time to transition it over to other folks, um, kind of build a sustainable strategy for it. Um, but travel, do some teaching, um, do some reading. And so that was, there was a lot of um, different motivations for it. Spend some more time with my family after, you know, being buried in my books um, during high school. Um, so that was definitely one of the most formative years of my life. And so when anybody asks, um, you know, and I was very privileged to be able to do all those things during that year um, and take that year, and I'm thankful for that. Um, but when folks have the option, I do highly encourage them to take take some time to be outside of the formal education system before going back, um, because they both played very crucial roles um, in my life journey, for sure. So it does sound like you had kind of a focus going into it. It wasn't just, hey, I'm going to, you know, sit on the couch and play video games kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. And there's, there's utility to that too. So, you know, there, <laughs> right. um, but no, that wasn't, that wasn't my, there wasn't, that was my plan going in. Okay. So let's dig into the book. So the book is titled, let me get AI and the future of education. Is that? I get that right. That is right. It is okay. it's nice and simple. It's <laughs> yes, <point. laughs> you, yeah. So, you know, I've I've interviewed a couple people doing AI, and each one has a different spin to it, a good spin. Um, but let's talk about the book, and maybe actually first, because I like to kind of gear this towards people that you know, teachers mostly are the people that listen to this. So, maybe talk about what was the. Um, I guess that process that happens, like what made you decide to write it. Who was your audience in mind? I'm assuming, you know, educators of some and what are the what are the takeaways? And you don't have to give give up the goods in this, but uh, <laughs> you can yeah. 
leave some teasers in there. No, for sure. Um, so I think that I kind of like set the stage for this earlier when I was talking about the journey and how um, folks were responding to my excitement initially about AI. Um, and that is really what drove me to write the book was kind of an opportunity to formalize some um, of the advice that I was giving to other folks, some of the thoughts that I was having, gave me the opportunity to think through things in a coherent manner. Um, writing for me is a great way to, you know, spend some time thinking, um, which, you know, um, I know our English teachers are talking a lot about these days, um, but the importance of writing. And so, um, but yeah, so that was, uh, it was a great opportunity to kind of sit down and think through um, some of the larger questions in education. Um, but, you know, while there's a little bit of that in the beginning and the end, and I do, you know, try to leave folks with some questions about what this might mean for us in the next five years, some say three years, some say 15 years, but um, in the future um, and near future by most definitions, um, but also kind of give a very practical introduction to, you know, what the utility of it is in the classroom, um, what might be coming up in the next few years, what are, what are likely, um, you know, tech platforms we'll see, tools we'll see that will pop up. Um, to kind of start jar getting people to think about um, what role will they play in their own pedagogical styles? Um, how will they approach the technology themselves? And how might they use it um, productively rather than just see it as this plagiarism and cheating tool? Um, there's, it's meant to be tool agnostic. And so um, that, it, you know, whatever tool of choice folks have at any time when they're reading it, um, the book was supposed to be more um, inspirational in terms of, okay, like how might I use Claude to do this or ChatGPT to do this rather than here's how to use ChatGPT. Um, and so that hopefully that allows it to kind of be um, a bit more timeless than I think a lot of things end up being in this era when things are moving so fast. And so that was, of course, a concern with a, um, you know, publisher published book where I can't just put out a new edition um, immediately. Um, yeah. Uh, so this may sound like a silly question, but one of my other uh, guests had done this. Um, did you use AI to write the book? Yeah, so um, their preface co covers this. Um, my contract with Wiley was very clear that I was not to like write the book with AI. Um, and so uh, there were, AI did not write the book, um, but AI was, was definitely a helpful partner in, in the writing process. And so um, I have some of those prompts in there that I use. And so um, my favorite example of where, um, especially at that stage, the, the technology was, wasn't, um, it is nowhere, uh, wasn't nowhere as capable as it even is now um, in, in its writing capabilities. But one of my favorite uses of it during the book were, um, you'll see, in, like if you look through all the examples, you'll see To Kill a Mockingbird a lot. Um, and that's because that's like, that my go-to example is To Kill a Mockingbird for most, uh, just like that's where my brain goes, that and like um, different types of rocks um, when I'm coming up with quick examples. Um, ChatGPT helped me come up with some more creative examples. And so when I was spitting out um, 10 different prompts and I ended up using To Kill a Mockingbird for all of them, it was nice to bring and say, oh, like uh, maybe this in a science classroom, how might I think about this? Or um, in an English classroom that's not using To Kill a Mockingbird, what kind of um, prompts might this look like? Um, to really help push the boundaries of the creativity there. I think that was, that was uh, it was definitely useful for that. Um, and then Grammarly is a lifesaver. Um, I think just in terms of making sure that some of my um, verbose sentences kind of got cut down. So definitely a great uh, partner just in getting syntax down, uh, making sure that something that made a lot of sense to me maybe was not the, uh, the cleanest way to say it. Um, all of those kinds of uh, uses of the AI tools were definitely um, super productive and helpful in the process. I, I, loved, I loved your answer there because you kind of, I think, gave a, a nice overview of how teachers should kind of approach AI. Because you said, you know, I, I wrote this book and I used AI to help me with a lot of the pieces uh, to actually push my creativity rather than hinder the creativity. I think that's what we want to blend into as, as educators to make sure that, you know, kids aren't just using it for cheating and having AI write things for them, but actually use it as a tool to, to hopefully push, push their creativity and their boundaries and, and do some of the uh, maybe lesser fun things of the writing process to, to, to guide us. So do you think that's kind of the a takeaway maybe? Yeah, um, definitely for our older students, I think when we start thinking about how they might use these tools productively um, to augment their own writing voices, um, to kind of, you know, streamline have their writing process and get a, a second pair of eyes on things, because whenever we write, that's always a good idea, um, whether it be a human or, you know, maybe now an AI bot. Um, and so definitely a great example of being able to use it in a collaborative way where it's not um, wholesale replacing uh, my work or my experience in the in the area, um, but it's definitely helping me uh, make that more polished and make it more accessible for more folks. And, and that's, I think, maybe 
you know, again, there's always the dark side. I mean, I watch Terminator, you know, <laughs> you start putting AI into a weapon, then, you know, things might get scary fast. But also just from an, from an education standpoint and something I've thought a, a lot about with this whole uh, AI kind of revolution happening before us is, you know, the creative process is hard, you know, and it's hard. I think part of being a creative person is kind of pushing through some hard stuff. Um, and, and my worry is that sometimes AI can become too much of a, maybe a crutch yeah. and it may not push our boundaries intellectually. It, it, we may, you know, I don't want us to become soft in our, our writing, I guess, and our creative. And I think when I, when I ask this question, I'm thinking of, you know, a lot of the art AI things, you know, like, You'll say, you know, create a dog, you know, riding a bicycle. It'll do it, but there's always something a little quirky, a little odd, a little weird, and it kind of like, ah, you know, there, there is still a human piece that sometimes, you know, falls into the uh, the nether world, I guess, for lack of a better term. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, and you know, I think that there's there right now. It does seem to be that there's these like um, actual deficiencies in the final work product. And so, um, when ChatGPT writes something, uh, especially with a very like simple prompt with um, not too much um, you know guidance, um, it's it's very clearly written by AI for most folks. Um, even if you're not used to like using tools, you're like, ah, that sounds like ChatGPT. Yeah, folks kind of have this intuitive response to the final output. Images, you're right. The most image generators are still not to the point where they're completely um, like uh, indistinguishable from real images or human generated images. Um, and they will get things wrong that like a human would never get wrong. For example, like it might add an extra leg to a dog um, depending on the generator you're using. And these things are all getting better. Um, but we also need to start like, you know, that those are temporary deficiencies. And so these tools are going to get better. Um, Claude's newest model does a great job of sounding a little bit more human um, than ChatGPT did, and especially than it did uh, two years ago. Um, and I think these models will continue to kind of reduce those deficiencies and be more human-like um, and mimic that human those human qualities in the final work product pretty well. Um, the thing that we like to talk about, and this is where my philosophy background maybe is coming through, um, is that no matter what, the that process does actually like get in, is part of the actual final work product as well for us, especially when it comes to art and creativity. Um, and so when we're talking about something like a poem, um, even if it can indistinguishably create a poem. Um, you know, that, about grief. When you read a poem written about grief from a Holocaust survivor is one of the examples I talk about, um, you have a particular emotive response because you know that there's there's a human behind that that felt those emotions that went through a particular, particular um, turmoil that caused those emotions. Um, and so no matter what, if like the final work product looks exactly the same, um, just the fact that there's a human behind one and not a human behind the other does you know, change our, our perception of it, um, let alone what writing the poetry does for the human themselves. Um, and so, you know, we can we can definitely talk about why in the creative world, um, AI is still very, you know, there are, sh there are shortcomings, um, but I think there's some permanent shortcomings no matter how great the technology gets. And I think that's also important to talk about, especially as the technology moves um, as quickly as it has been. You know, it kind of reminds me at this stage, and I, I'm, you may not remember this depending on your age, but I remember when really the internet was new, a uh, Google was new and there were all these, you know, websites out there, uh, all these, you know, different things. And it was, it was kind of exploded, you know, there's just so much out there and then slowly things just started, you know, falling off like this website, you know, uh, let's just, you know, what was it? Uh, it wasn't Yahoo. What was one of the original internet uh, net, that something um, that thing that remember what it was like that, something that you know um and slowly these big companies just started one by one kind of falling like um do you sense that's kind of where this is headed is we're going to start getting some really tried and true i know chat gpt is kind of the big uh fish in the pond right now but do you think they're going to kind of funnel because i know in education uh, every time i turn around there's a new AI, you know, website or tool or something that's designed for education. And it beca it's becoming overwhelming right now. So do you think it's going to funnel down? Yeah, I mean, it's also, that's the major of most of the tech booms. And I think, think there will be, um, you know, there'll be some tools that will be the players in the, in the space. 
Um, and so they'll, it'll eventually narrow down to like the equivalent insertion just will be like our Bing chats and our Googles. Um, and then there'll always be these like these mid-level tools that there's like this quirky population that likes to use. And so um, there's always somebody who still likes to use Yahoo search and there's somebody who likes to use, um, you know, uh, they're like more privacy forward uh, search engines. Like there's lots of, there is still a lot of variability within the, even like the search engine space. Um, even though like when we all think search engine, we immediately think Google. Um, and something similar will continue to happen, I think in the AI space. Um, what stays and what leaves, I think would be, um, if I could answer those questions, <laughs> um, we would be having, uh, yeah, a very different um, life. Um, but I think just in terms of thinking about like, I think there'll be a lot of edu educator, um, like the educators will start controlling the process a bit more. I think right now um, th there is a bit more of a passive role because they're, they are being inundated with so many different tools. Um, a lot of the tools they're already using um, are starting to incorporate AI. So they're now not only, you know, learning new tools, um, grasping new concepts, learning how to use like, you know, ChatGPT itself organically. Um, and then suddenly like the tool that you were using for the last 10 years and now has all these new AI features that's it, that are in your face. Uh, and even non-educational tools are doing that. And so that's not unique. Um, but I think as teachers become more, you know, careful about, um, oh, I've kind of learned that I don't really like it when it generates the funny questions on Kahoot's for me, but I like it when it generates the content ones after I upload my, right? Like they'll start to have natural um, inclinations towards what kinds of these tools they'll like. And I think the market will kind of start speaking um, more clearly with the, um, with the target population of educators. Okay. Um, so let's put AI aside. Are there any other educational trends that you're following? Yeah, so the one that I am really um, uh, with my popcorn because I'm a bit more of a passive player in this one um, is figuring out this like the banning of f cell phones in schools. And I think that it's a great, um, you know, it's it juxtaposed so well with the, the integration of AI within our education system because I think they're almost polar opposites in some ways. Um, and they really force us to ask about the role of technology, um, the role of human interaction. Um, and so I'm really curious to see uh, large scale implementations of cell phone bans. Um, I'm curious to see what that does for uh, student mental health. Um, I'm curious to see what that does for AI integration projects. Um, I and yeah, just in general, like I think I'm I'm sitting there. Um, I am rooting for the cell phone banners, um, but you know I'm trying to see what the most sustainable <laughs> strategy that folks come up with um, are uh, because I think our, our students are distracted. And so um, definitely one where um, that seems like a very easy solution to dramatically change educational outcomes. And so um, I'm excited to see where it goes. Yeah, our, the school that I'm in is, we're considering that for this coming year. So we'll have yeah. some data there probably. Okay, so here are some three fun questions for you. Um, let's start with, um, are you a gamer? And what's am, your game? I am not a gamer. Um, so <laughs> maybe I- Angry, angry a... <laughs> birds or- um, with friends, anything. Like. Chris is my go-to if I really need something to uh, kind of uh, tune everything out. Um, but that's a very basic answer. <laughs> <So maybe. laughs> okay, that's no problem. Yeah. Um, do you have a favorite tablet, uh, iPad? You know, anything like that? Yeah. Ahead. So um, I, I, my iPad Pro is. A, I like to handwrite, and that seems to be a middle ground most of the time. Whenever I'm trying to annotate something, and so my iPad Pro is definitely up there. Um, I'm really interested in checking out the Remarkable tablet. I don't know if you've seen that, um, but that's that's oh. it keeps popping up on my newsfeed. Um, they it's basically like uh, the size of an iPad, um, but they have no color, so it's it's very much meant to mimic like the the paper the way the initial Kindle did. Um, and so, but it looks no taking abilities. Uh, apparently, the feel of a pen. Um, and so, for you know, those of us who still like some analog note taking, that might be a, a, an even better middle ground. So I'll, I'll keep my eye interesting. Out. Yeah. All right, and uh, favorite social network? Um, Instagram is my favorite social network. Um, those, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, just like you know, lots, lots of lots of fun things on there, and a good mindless uh, use of some time sometimes. Um, but sometimes cool things pop up too, like the remarkable tablet. And so I, this might be an ad for <laughs> a remarkable yeah. at this point. But <laughs> yeah, no, I agree. I, I find. You know, first of all, yeah, I do probably waste more time on it than others, <laughs> but I do see there's a lot of like self help stuff, really good right. recipes, tech Recipe tips. Is a there's, uh, I get, I think, some learning from it and some inspiration. So I'm, I'm not going to knock that one. Um, I think we've answered most of them, but let's just do what is your favorite way to unplug from technology? We'll end on that one. 
Yeah. Um, speaking of the recipes and um, like cooking, uh, cooking is my go-to. Um, I love to try different cuisines from all over the world um, and try to figure out how to uh, make them um, and then try to remake them the same way the second time, which is <laughs> more challenging than making it um, at all in the first place. So um, definitely a very uh, mindful thing because you're very aware of all your senses. Um, you have to focus, can't kind of like be doing anything else or lest you burn um, whatever you're cooking. Um, and so that's my, that's my go-to way to unplug. That's a great one. I think that's a coffee with a geek first, to be honest with you. So oh, good job. Something nice. new. <laughs> so Peyton, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, your answers and your book, I'm looking forward to it. I'm going to get my copy of it and um, can't wait to kind of follow you and see where you're going with this. Cause it seems like you're on the move and uh, your energy is uh, really contagious. So uh, keep oh, up awesome. the great work. Thank you. I'm happy to share that with everybody today.